Hi, this video is about how to follow God. I'm Bake Adafi, and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. If you'd find your Bible and open it to Ephesians chapter 5, we'll begin in just a moment. Ephesians is the book we're studying. This is lesson 18, and we're starting with chapter 5 and verse 1. If you'd like to open your Bible there, we'll begin, at, begin reading at verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you, with vain words. For because of these things comes the wrath of God on the children of disobedience. Be not therefore partakers with them, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father, it is our desire that you meet with us in this lesson, that you take these words that are on ink, on paper, and that you make them come alive to our minds and our hearts, that we might see you clearly, and we might understand what it means to follow you, and not to walk in darkness, but to walk in the light, to be a sweet-smelling savor to you like the Lord Jesus was, to prove what is acceptable to you in our lives. We ask for your Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds, to guide us. He is our teacher of your word. Thank you for inspiring it, for having it written down by your holy apostles and prophets. Lord, use it to benefit your people and your church and to save lost people. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, how to follow God. Verse one and two talks about follow God and walk in love. There aren't any chapter divisions uh, in the original um, inscription of the of the Bible of the of the New Testament and the check the text just flows from one idea to the next so this idea that we are to be followers of God has a lot to do with what has preceded it in chapter 4 and we can see uh, what has happened in chapter 4 um, in verse 25 it begins to talk about um, he, here's how you follow God now, you'd think that there'd be some special formula, some way to, uh, to act like God, some way to, um, to, to um, be imitators of Him. And what it comes down to is the very simple things that He commands us to do in His Word. The things He commands us not to do, and the things He commands us, commands us to do. Verse 25, put away lying. Don't lie anymore. Tell the truth with people. Um, don't sin when you're angry. Don't give any place to the devil. Don't let the devil have a toehold in your life or a claw hold or a place that he can begin to work in your life and, and manipulate you and cause you to sin against God. Don't let that happen. Don't give him a place. Don't steal. I mean, this is kind of, kind of simple. Don't steal from other people. Don't um, speak well. Speak grace into people's lives. Speak to their hearts and speak the word of God to them to you, that you can benefit them. Speak to them. Um, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Don't make the Holy Spirit sad because of, uh, of the way that you live. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. I mean, these are things that who would ever think that they were to follow God by, by doing these things? Not lying, not stealing, not cheating, 
uh, loving people, speaking grace into their lives. That's how you follow God. Uh, these things are anathema to the natural man. Natural people don't do these things. They don't follow God. They do their own thing, and they don't care who they hurt in the process. It says, be tender-hearted and forgiving as God has forgiven us. We are to be like God and to follow God by doing these things. As a child follows their parents. Um, some of you have raised children. I've raised children. And um, up until a certain point in their lives, they believe everything you tell them. And they follow after you. And they want to please you. And sometimes they don't. And you have to teach them the word no. And there has to be spankings involved and discipline. But on the whole, they're interested in what you think of them, and they want to do like you do. They want to follow you. And here we're supposed to be as the dear children of God, following Him, imitating Him, in the way that we live here on earth. In the everyday decisions we make, in the everyday patterns of our lives, we are to follow God and to live according to His commandments and to be obedient to Him. Do like your Heavenly Father does. He tells you how to do it because He gives you commands. Don't do these things. Do these things. Particularly, He wants us to follow Him in forgiving others. At the end of chapter 4, verse 32, forgive one another as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Be imitators of God. Be a forgiving person. Forgive other people. Uh, let them know that you're not holding a grudge against them. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that um, whatever has transpired between you is water under the bridge and you have a relationship with them that can't be broken by any sins. Verse 2 says, walk in love. You know, this is, well, how do you do that? Well, you obey God and you love other people. So your relationship with God, your relationship with other people. You pursue God with your whole heart, mind, and strength, and soul. You're hungry after Him. You want to know who He is. You desire Him, and you're kind and considerate of other people. You treat them well. You speak grace into their lives. This is the third time He said, he said this. In chapter 4, verse 1, He said, uh, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling wherewith you're called. How do you walk? You walk a worthy walk. And then he goes on to list all the things that you're not supposed to do and all the things that you're supposed to do in this whole chapter. And then in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth not walk, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. Don't be walking like you used to walk. Don't live like you used to live. Uh, let there be a change in your life. You don't want to live like that anymore. You want to follow God and be imitators of God, and put that old life behind you, and live a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are uh, then an offering to God, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Uh, just like when um, Noah came out of the ark, and he offered up animals, and uh, God smelled that smell, and it was a sweet smell in his nostrils, and he purposed not to destroy the earth again. Or in the temple, when the offerings were made, they were a, a sweet smell in God's nostrils. Or the incense that burned in the holy place inside the temple, it was a, a sweet smell in God's nostrils. And he accepted um, the people as he smelled that. All these things please God. And Jesus' sacrifice was such an offering. It's uh, proverbially a uh, sweet smell sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God as Jesus offered himself up for us in our place on the cross to bear our sins so that we don't have to bear that. The opposite of this is, you know, if you've ever smelled garbage burning, you know the terrible stench that that is. Or uh, something is on the stove and uh, it's boiling over or burning over and it's burning and that's a terrible smell. Um, opposed to these things, well, when you go to sell a house, you uh, sometimes you bake bread and let that smell waft throughout the whole house and it smells good. People come in and they're, they're attracted because of the smell. Or when you're walking through your neighborhood and you smell somebody uh, barbecuing uh, steaks on a grill and, and that smell hits your nostrils, it's a good smell. Well, this is what it's like that we are supposed to 
offer ourselves up to God as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to Him. The opposite of the stench that we could be, we're supposed to be obedient to Him and imitate Him. Here's how we love God sacrificially, just like Jesus did, and it's costly to us. Romans 12:1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, verses 1 and 2, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, there it is there. We are to live before God as a sacrifice. That's kind of an oxymoron. What does that mean? How can you be a sacrifice and still be alive? Well, you make your life in obedience to what God commands, uh, putting away the sins, seeking after Him with the whole heart, and doing all the things He requires of us. It says, your bodies is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is what God expects of us. He expects of us to be new creatures. He expects of us to live for Him, to turn our lives around, to follow hard after Him. Now, His Spirit is working in our lives, inside of us, to do this, but we are cooperating with the Spirit. We are putting 100% of our effort into cooperating with the Spirit to do this. Don't be conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2 says. Don't be like the world. Don't live like the world. What's that mean? Well, the world is not the planet spinning around. It's the people in the world. It's the world system. It's the system that Satan has set up to keep us away from God, to keep us uh, separate from Him. Don't live like that. Don't be conformed to that. Don't go along with that but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind has to be on the Scripture. Your mind is transformed when you think of the things of God, when you let the Scripture work its way down into the very soul of your body so that you understand God, you understand what He requires of you, and you're not going to be like you once were. You're going to be transformed. Renew your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you please God? How are you conformed to, to Him? How do you follow Him? How are you transformed? Well, it's the Word of God in your life and it's your obedience to it. And it's your relationship to God. It's your relationship to other people. It's a living sacrifice that we are supposed to be. The next verses say, Don't live in sin, rather give thanks. Verses 3 and 4, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. So this is a list of sins. Saints don't live like this. People that are saved don't live like this. They don't live there anymore. That's not their address. They may, uh, uh, on occasion, fall into that, but they, they leave there. They live someplace else. They live for God. Saints are saved people. The Catholic idea that you have to be dead and uh, perform some miracles and be voted in by the Catholic Church to be a saint is not true. Every person that trusts in Christ is a saint. That's what this word means. Set apart to God. Sexual sins are denounced here. Fornication and uncleanness. This is the seventh commandment. This goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 20. Don't commit these sexual sins fornication and uncleanness. And there are sins of the mind, uh, of the desire, uh, covetousness, lust. Uh, that's the commandment number 10. Um, it's going to lead to these other, uh, these other things, fornication and uncleanness. These should never be named among Christians. Uh, don't talk about them. It shouldn't, well, by not being named, it means nobody does that within our group of people within our church. We don't, we don't do that, so it's never talked about. Well, so-and-so is committing these sins. We don't do that. That's not the way we live. We live set apart to God. We live holy lives. We're saints. We don't break the seventh commandment. We don't break the tenth commandment. Ephesians um, chapter 2, verse 2 says, Where and in times past you walked. You used to live that way, but not anymore. You're not like that anymore, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That's the way we were 
before our salvation. But we're changed now. The Holy Spirit has come to take up residence within us. He has given us a new mind and a new heart. We understand God. We can hear from Him. We can pray to Him and be heard by Him. And when this happens, you have a new outlook on life. Uh, your reasonable service is to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Don't walk according to the course of the world. Walk according to the things that God requires of you. Be an imitator of God by not sinning and by obedient to the things that He tells you to do. Then there are the sins of the speech, filthiness, Foolish talking, verse 4, jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. This is fu fi filthy speech, foolish speech, jesting. It's the back and forth between people trying to outdo one another. It's, it's the person who uh, is trying to prove how smart they are by how filthy their speech can be, trying to be impressive to other people. It's obscene words. It's X-rated and R-rated. Speech you don't use around people that you, uh, are your parents or somebody who's a pastor or people in a, in a group where you care about what they think about you. You respect them by not using this, these kinds of words. This is one of the first things to go when you become a Christian. Your speech begins to change. The habit patterns that you have of those filthy words the Holy Spirit is inside you and, he, and your conscience is there and they begin to work together to prick you and tell you when you're saying those words, stop that, pick other words, choose other ways to express yourself. Don't go down that path that you went down so many times before. It says, don't use these kind of words, but rather give thanks. Be thankful to God for all the blessings that you receive from Him. Even in the midst of your trials and temptations, you can be thankful to God. You can look to Him and give Him glory, give Him praise, and do, and do that instead of trying to impress other people with how vulgar you can be. Impress them with your uh, praise for God and your thanksgiving to God and how He's blessed you. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. That you, know my, that you may know how to answer every man. So your speech should be graceful speech. Speech that ministers the grace of God to other people. Seasoned with salt. To stop the corruption in the world. Not, these kind of, not this kind of speech, this foolishness, this filthiness, this jesting. Those, those things don't get you where you want to go as a Christian. They're, they're inconvenient. Rather give thanks to God. And then... Matthew 12, 36 and 37 says, But I say to you, now this should, this should uh, cause the hair on the back of our necks to stand up. These are Jesus' words. I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That's pretty scary. You're going to have to stand before God and those things you said you were just uh, you know, tossing out words and not thinking about what you're saying and not caring what you were saying and, and being vulgar and, and being filthy and, and trying to impress other people. Those words are going to be judged by God, those idle words. Every word that we speak is going to be judged by God. And you give account of those in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified and by your words you shall be condemned. What comes out of you, out of your speech, out of your mouth, shows where your heart is. If you've been forgiven, if you've gotten a new heart, if there's a new person living inside you, if the Holy Spirit is there, He's going to produce good things coming out of your mouth. Minister grace to the people that hear you, not this foolishness and filthiness and um, jesting, which are not convenient. Here's how not to inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 5. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ, in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Know this, there's a warning here. This should send up a red flag and a big red stoplight and a big stop sign in your life. You're going down the wrong path if you're doing these things. This is not how to be saved in the, into the kingdom of God. You have no inheritance in the kingdom if you live this way. If, you, if the tenor of your life, if the direction of your life 
uh, encompasses these sexual sins and this covetousness and this idolatry, you aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. Living like this guarantees that you're not in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have no interest in Him. You're not placed there in the heavenly places by God as you're saved. Opposite of that, you're going to end up in hell. No forgiveness for your sins. Separated from God forever. Examine our hearts. That's what he's trying to tell us. Take a look at your life. Are you going the wrong direction? Are these sins that he's named in verse 5 part of your existence? Whoremongers, uncleanness, prostitution, um, pursue sexual sin. Is that the direction of your life? Matthew 5, 20, 28, Jesus says, But I say to you, this is, this is the heart of sexual sin. This is where it lies within us. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. It's not just you jumped in bed with someone else's wife, or you're married and you jumped in bed with someone else. It's the, it's the thoughts that you entertain. It's the look of lust. It's looking and lusting. It's God being able to look down into our souls and see what we are down in there. And He sees this sin within us. And it's our idolatry. Exodus 20, verses 3 through 6 says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So no idols. You have to have God first in your life. This is His requirement. Put Him first in your life. You need the Holy Spirit to be able to do this. You need to follow after God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Put Him first. Put away your sins. Have no idols in your life. Nothing in the earth, beneath the earth, or in the water. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. What is He jealous of? He's jealous of your attention being fixed upon something that is not Him, that is an idol. And He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. This is replacing God with something of your own imagination, either a creature or an object, and worshiping that thing. I mean, we're very sophisticated today. Uh, some churches still have their idols in their churches. They're statues of people and they pray to those things. Um, but but you should be smarter than that, and, and, and we're smart enough to make up our God. We think that, well, we are in juxtaposition to what the Scripture says. For instance, my God would never put anybody in hell. Well, have you read the Scripture? You make an idol out of that. You rest your look at, for eternity upon something that you've made up out of your own mind, that God wouldn't put anybody in hell, or that... He doesn't demand that we live a, a, a good life, a perfect life, a life of obedience, or He doesn't demand that we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are many ways uh, to get to God, and Jesus is just one of those ways. All those things are idolatry. Those are, those are things that set us apart from the direction that God wants us to go and puts His wrath upon us. The wrath of God is upon those uh, that hate Him. Exodus 20:17 says, "You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is your neighbor's. You don't want anything that's your, uh, of your neighbor. You're not satisfied with what God has given you. God's not first place in your life. He's going to provide everything that you need. You don't need to seek after those things. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. He has to be first in your life. That's what covetousness is. That's where you put emphasis on things above God. That is the essence of idolatry. The covetousness really kind of encompasses all the other commandments. God's not first, and you lie, and you cheat, and you steal, and you commit sexual sin. 
and you don't honor your father and mother, you want to do your own thing. It's all putting yourself above God. That's what this covetousness is. Whoremongers, unclean persons, or covetous man who is an idolater. Covetousness is equated with idolatry here. These are God replacements, and they have no place in the kingdom of God. Colossians 3 verses 5 through 6 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means to put to death. It's the old way of saying, put those things to death. So they never completely die. They'll always be um, kind of in the background. <laughs> but put them to death by the way that you live. Don't go after them. Don't feed them. Don't pursue them. Put them to death. Mortify those members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. Put all these things to death. This is how you follow God. You put those to death. You make Him the very most important thing in your life. And you don't seek after those things and you don't have covetousness be the way that you live. There's no inheritance in the kingdom of God for people who live like that. Then it says, don't be deceived. Wrath comes from God on people who live like this in verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, because of living like that in those sins, the wrath of God comes upon children of disobedience. Let no man deceive you. Don't listen to people who will lead you astray. Make sure that you're like the Bereans in the book of Acts who very carefully look at the scripture and compare what they're hearing from the preacher to what the book says. That's what we should be like. We should compare what is being preached with what the book says. And if it's not in the book, then disregard it. That is a false prophet. That is someone who's speaking not from God. That's the health and wealth gospel of today and so many other different variations and, 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 and sh offshoots of what the truth is. Psalms 115 describes this, this person who doesn't see God and who's trying to deceive others into believing in the God that's not there that he's made up. It says, 100, Psalm 115, beginning in verse 1, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name, Give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So God gets the glory. He is merciful and he is truth. And he gets glory for that. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? And that's what these people are saying, these deceivers that we're reading about in Ephesians chapter 5. Where's their God? He's not watching. He's not looking. He has no senses. He doesn't know what you're doing. Do what you want. Make him up. Be like you live like you want to live. It says in Psalm 115, verse 3, But our God is in the heavens. He has done whatever he has pleased. Where's God? He's in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. No one can say to him and stop him from doing what he wants. Here's the opposite of that. Verse 4 in Psalm 115. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Can you imagine worshiping something that you make yourself? How is that a God? It's just foolishness. They have mouths, but they speak not. So this is uh, personifying these idols, but it's also talking about the people who worship these idols. God's not hearing them. The idols can't speak to you. There's nothing behind there but demons. And they're not in your favor. And they're not going to be nice to you and good to you. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet they have, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throats. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. So the idols can't see can't hear, can't touch, can't walk, can't speak. They are just nothing. And so are the people that worship them. Don't let anyone deceive you with vain words. 
Here's where the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. Verse 6 in Ephesians. Don't let anyone deceive you about this. To think that God doesn't see what's in your heart, He does. He knows exactly what's there. He does see. And His wrath is upon all people who live in disobedience to Him. Acts 17, verse 30 and 31 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He has ordained, whereof He has given assurance unto all men that He has raised Him from the dead. The wrath of God is going to come on the children of disobedience. Don't be ignorant. You worship idols, that wrath is going to come down on your head. God commands all men everywhere to repent of their sins, to turn from their sins, to trust in Him. And He's given assurance that it's going to be, judgment is going to come because He raised Jesus from the dead. He's going to judge the world in righteousness by the Lord Jesus, and He's given assurance that the judgment is coming and that the judge is going to be the Lord Jesus because He raised Him from the dead. John 5.22 says, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment into the hands of the Son. All judgment is going to come from the Lord Jesus. The wrath of God is going to be upon the children of disobedience. If you live in disobedience to God, God's going to come down on you with both feet in the Lord Jesus at the judgment. Disobey, and God's going to judge you in wrath. Don't be partakers of them. Verse 7. Be not therefore partakers of them, partakers with them. Don't partake of them. Who? Those deceivers. Those who would lead you astray into sin and then into judgment. Don't be fooled. Don't go there. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Be not deceived. Don't be tricked. Don't be fooled. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It's a nice way of saying the company that you keep, the people that you listen to, the people that you follow, the people that you hang out with, can really mess you up if you do that. Don't listen to those people. Don't listen to their speech and their evil communication. It will corrupt you. It will corrupt the way that you live. When we speak to people in the jail, we tell them you have to leave behind all the old friends that you had. Otherwise, you go back to those friends, you're going to be right back in the jam that you're in now. You have to repent of those friends. You have to turn from them. Evil communication, having those wrong associates, those wrong friends, listening to what they have to say, they'll get you into a whole host of trouble. You have to turn away from that. You have to disassociate yourself from them. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3 and then verse 9 says this, But as there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you. So, just like there was in the Old Testament, there were false prophets tried to lead Israel astray. Uh, I mean, there were hundreds of them standing up against one guy. <laughs> I mean, false prophets everywhere. Don't listen to them. Who shall... Uh, and there's going to be false prophets among us in the New Testament who shall privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. If they're, if they're denying the Lord Jesus, that's your major clue that these people are false prophets. And bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now a long time lingers not, but their damnation slumbers not. In other words, they're, they're going to be judged and they're going to be damned for the way that they bring in heresies upon people. Don't be partakers with them. Be followers of God. Use the scripture wisely to discern good and evil, to understand what's the truth and what's not the truth. 2 Peter 2.9 says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So be godly. Look for the way out. No temptation has taken you. 
but such as is common to man and God is faithful who will not will with, will with the temptation provide a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Look for that way out. You will bear up under that temptation. Ungodly people are going to be reserved to the day of judgment. This is how we follow hard after God. How we look to Him and follow Him. The inheritance of those deceivers are death and the grave. Now in Ephesians 5 verses 8 through 10, Walk in the light, have the fruit of the Spirit, be pleasing unto God. For you were sometimes darkness, it says, verse 8, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Darkness is our pre-salvation condition. We are in darkness before we're saved. We don't understand God. God doesn't make sense to us. We don't seek after Him. We don't want to seek after Him. We want to go our own way. We're very pleased to go that way. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom, that is, the unbelievers, in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the mind of them which believe not. So Satan blinds the minds of people who don't believe. Lest the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. How do you follow God? Well, you have to be saved. You have to have a, a, a new birth. You have to have the Holy Spirit grant you repentance and faith and life through the Lord Jesus Christ, through His death, burial, and resurrection. Through faith in that. Otherwise, the God of this world has blinded your minds. That's a terrible condition to be in. We were sometimes in darkness. Everybody starts their life there. That's where we begin. You're born into the world, and you're born in darkness toward God. And until He shines the light into your life, you're going to stay there in the darkness. Romans 8, 7, it says, Because the carnal mind, that's the mind of someone who's not saved, that's a fleshly mind, a carnal mind, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So to have enmity with God means you're at a warfare. You're at loggerheads. You don't agree with each other. You don't agree with the mind of God. That's what the carnal mind is like. It disagrees with God. It wants to go its own way. It doesn't want to have anyone tell it what to do. It's perfectly capable of charting its own course. And especially when God tries to intervene in its life. It's not subject to His law. It doesn't obey His laws. It obeys its own laws. It makes its own laws. <laughs> That's the essence of being an idolater. Making your own laws. We're a law unto ourselves. We make up who God is and who we're going to worship and how we're going to live. Not subject to the laws of God, neither indeed can be. So that person who is unsaved cannot be subject to the law of God. That's what the darkness was like. You were sometimes in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. When Jesus comes into your life, He lights up every man who comes into the world. He comes into your life and He gives you life and He just turns the light bulb on in your brain and your mind. And that which was enmity against God before is desiring to know what He wants you to do and to please Him. How can I live for God? How can I be pleasing to Him? What would He have me to do? That's what I want to know. That's how I want to live. Light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In other words, Christian, if you've trusted in Christ, live like it. Walk like it. Jesus in the light is the light. In Him we are light. Live in accordance with it. Walk in that light. John 1, 1 through 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The beginning of creation, the Word, that's the Lord Jesus. He was with God at the beginning of creation. He was with the Father and the Spirit and the Son. We're all together in the creation. The Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, that's the Trinity. At the creation of the world is the Trinity. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. He is the instrument of creation. The Father 
uh, used the Son to create the world. He is the one who created everything. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. Where does life exist? It exists in God. Where does life come from? It only comes from God. Everything that is alive owes its existence to God. Nobody generated themselves. There wasn't any Big Bang. There wasn't any primordial ooze. There wasn't any chemical reactions. Everything came from God. It came out of His existence. He is life. And that life was the light of men, it says. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. But if you comprehend Him, you want to live like that. We were in sometimes in darkness, but we're not there anymore. We're in light now. We are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. John 1, 9 says, That was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. Jesus lights up the world. He shows people their sin. His presence on the earth was the culmination of God's promise to send His Christ, His Anointed One, into the world. The King of the Jews, the, the last prophet, the great high priest, all those things are the Lord Jesus. He is the true light. And everybody that wants to come to God has to come through Him. Then John 8, 12, Then spoke Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Oh, well, what could be plainer than that? <laughs> Who can say this, by the way? What person ever says this? What person makes this claim? I'm the light of the whole world. Jesus does. I'm the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You want to have a, li a life that pleases God? You want to follow God? You want to be his dear child? You want to walk in love as he has loved us and given himself for us? A sweet-smelling savor to God? You have to walk in the Lord Jesus. You have to trust him. You have to be in him. You have to commit yourself to him. This is a daily walk. It's a daily taking up our cross and putting our sins to death, and trusting in the Lord Jesus and following after him, knowing who he is, putting him first in our lives. Then spoke Jesus, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you're going to have a light of life and you will not walk in darkness. 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7 says, This then is the message which we've heard of him. Here's the message. I like the books that John wrote. They're so plain and so simple and so straightforward. This is the message. And declare unto you, we've heard it from him and we declare it to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, that means you obey God. You don't do the things that He says not to do, and you do the things He says to do. You're obedient to His commandments. If we don't do that, we're, we're lying. But if we do do it, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, with other believers who are, are living like that also. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You want to have your sins cleansed? You want to have a relationship with God? You want to be able to follow God? Walk in the light. Walk in the Lord Jesus. Live like He commands you to live. Obey His word. Listen to what He has to say. He's the light that lights up the whole world. He's the true light. Lights every man that comes into the world. You won't walk in darkness if you walk in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow Him. Then it says in verse 9, The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's what happens to you when you become a Christian. He comes into your life. You become His temple. God comes and dwells with you. God Himself in the form of His Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, lives inside each believer. He inhabits us. And that inhabitation allows us to be obedient to Him. It allows us to understand Him. It allows our minds to be open and not at enmity with God. It allows the darkness to be dispelled and the light to come. 
He's sent by the Lord Jesus. Our bodies are the temple of God. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. This is going to be the very best thing that can happen. I know you're going to be really sad when I die and I'm crucified and I'm raised from the dead and I ascend up in heaven, but it's going to be good because if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And the Holy Spirit comes and he came on the day of Pentecost in a big way, a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire sitting on each one of the, each one of the disciples. And he brings with him spiritual gifts and he brings with him spiritual fruit. He begins to change you from the inside out so that you look more and more like the Lord Jesus. This is our sanctification. This is God working in us to change us. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what you get when you get the Holy Spirit inside you when, when you're saved. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. All those things, he begins to work inside every believer to one degree or another, depending upon how deep you were into sin, depending upon how resistant you are to his efforts to change you, but he's going to work those things in your life. And he has every circumstance about you under his control. He has your income, he has your health, he has your family, he has your job, he has all your friends, he has everything about you, where you live, everything. And he begins to work inside of you to produce these fruits as you uh, put your roots down into the Lord Jesus. And those fruits are produced into your life. Against such, there, such things there is no law. Galatians 5.22 goes on to say. Verse 8 says, walk as children of light. Verse 9 says, have the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is in goodness and righteousness and truth. This is what shows that you are in Christ. When you have these fruits in your life, that you are indeed walking in the light and a child of the light. The Holy Spirit is in you and he produces fruit, good works within you. So you can prove, verse 10, what is acceptable unto the Lord. So the proof here is you live it out. This is what your life is like. In obedience to Jesus' commands, in obedience to the Holy Spirit within you, in love toward the Father, in love toward other people. You work it out. You prove it within your life. Test it. Live it. And see that, it's, see that it works. Do what's pleasing to God. See that He accepts you and that your prayers get answered and that, that He um, pours blessings into your life. And he gives mercy to you. And he gives his grace to you. Uh, Matthew chapter 25 verse 23 says, His Lord said unto him, This is what you want to hear when you stand before God. The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. The things of this life that God gives us to do. Uh, it's true that God has a plan for every believer. And he works it out in your life. He gives you spiritual gifts and He fits you into, the, into a church and you're supposed to use those gifts for the benefit of others and for the benefit of the broader church worldwide. And He does this in your life. And He wants to commend you for being obedient to Him. You want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That is, in heaven, we receive um, the crowns of glory. We receive those things which we've done in our body, the obedient things that we've done for God. Prove what is acceptable to, acceptable to Him. You want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You that uh, we are no longer in darkness when we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But He is the light of the world. He is the light that lights up our life. We can walk in that light. We can put away all the sins of our flesh, put away all the sins of our speech, and we can be acceptable to You. Lord, help us to work to prove what is acceptable in our lives, to be obedient to You, to trust You, 
in the way that we speak, in the way that we live. Help us to be excellent witnesses of how you can change our hearts and minds and souls. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins that's in his blood. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that makes him alive to us. Thank you, Father, for sending him and receiving him back up into heaven. Thank you that he sits at your right hand now in the heavenly places, and he makes intercession for those who have trusted in him. Lord, do that in our lives, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, Lesson 19, we'll begin with chapter 5 and verse 11. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study His Word. If you have questions or comments on this lesson, please email me at all one word, Bible study, v by v at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study, verse by verse. Thank mm -hmm. you.